Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 341 of the All Dolphins podcast on this Sunday, August 25th. Two days before NFL teams have to get down to the 53-player roster limits. And as you probably are aware by now, if you're watching the All Dolphins podcast, I'm going to guess you're aware, the Dolphins already have gotten a head start on making their roster moves involving two players Sunday morning, one of them being quarterback Mike White released uh, as confirmed by a league source. And the same goes for tight end Jody Fortson Jr. And Chris Perkins is joining me again from the South Florida Sun Sentinel. How's that for, how's that for an introduction? I like that. I like that crowd noise. Very, very nice. Very nice. A, a gathering of uh, dozens there. And in fact, it actually, a <laughs> gathering of dozens, yes. Actually, it reminded me that I should have gone Darth Vader when you wrote your column last week and should have gone like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I got enough of that on social media. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, you did. Okay, enough with the silly silly and goofiness. We're going to obviously talk Dolphins roster and roster cuts, maybe discuss a little bit of what we saw in the preseason finale, and again with the line not blocking in the middle on third and short. But we need to start with, Mike White, so Chris Perkins, I ask you your initial reaction when you heard the news Sunday morning. Um, I, I think Mike White should be on the 53-man roster. I've, I've said that. I've written that. He's not. And the Dolphins made the right choice as far as what we saw in training camp. Skylar Thompson was clearly the better performing quarterback. There is zero doubt about that. The only thing that I thought could have kept Mike White in the running for number two was kind of the intangibles that we know that um, Mike White knows how to fill in as a starter fairly effectively. We saw that with the Jets two years ago. We know that players rally around him, right? The Jets loved him. And we know that the fans rallied around him, which isn't as important. But, you know, that was to me what Mike White had going for him is that, you know, you get these guys in the huddle to believe in you. On the other hand, when I asked Skylar Thompson after the Washington game, what were his focal points for training camp in the offseason? He said getting the ball out of his hands quickly, making good reads. And these are the things that they always talk about with Tua, right? These are the tools that they like to have in this offense Skyler did that. So as far as the unfield tangibles, no question about it. The Dolphins made the right decision. In the interest of fairness, let us mention all the factors that possibly could have been involved. We're going to speak to GM Chris Greer after the cuts to 53 are made. And let's realize that the Dolphins saved $3.5 million in cap space by dumping Mike White. And this is where, as I suggested on Miami Dolphins on SI in my story, breaking down this move, now Mike White becomes a free agent, can negotiate with any team around the NFL. Certainly would not surprise me in the remotest if the Dolphins were to re-sign Mike White to the practice squad and maybe even eventually back to the 53-man roster now that the, that the guarantee $3.5 million is off the table. If we're going to be honest about it, I don't know that Mike White, and this is something Mike McDaniel made a point to say a couple of times last week. You know, we put our backup quarterbacks in tough situations uh, because we wanted to see how they react. Well, Mike White was put in some, I mean, damn bad situations, if we're going to be honest about it, yeah. uh, in, including we already discussed this, you know, before, like playing with a wide receiver and running back at the end of the Washington game and three wide receivers who weren't with the team in July. And then on Friday night, why was it that unlike the first game when Skylar Thompson had the entire first half, Mike White had the entire second half, why was it that Friday night Mike White didn't get to finish the first half? And if you look at Mike White's work in that game, he had four drives. They ended with Jeff Wilson getting stuffed on the third and one run. They ended with two sacks. And you recall those, it's it's Chris Braswell of the of the Bucks zipping by Baron Matos, mm -hmm. who's a rookie free agent, who's raw as raw can be, uh, to get to Mike White, had no chance. The other one is Patrick Paul getting pushed back to where Mike White's arm gets hit. And the other one, 
was a play where he had nobody open. They eventually checked down to Jeff Wilson Jr., where he probably wouldn't have gotten the first down anyway, but dropped the pass. So, again, you look at the totality of the circumstances. Mike White did not play well. I'm not going to say that. But I, I think the numbers are a lot uglier than the actual performance. There were a couple of bad, a couple of bad throws, including there was a, a screen pass that was way off the mark. But I think – I don't know that he played as poorly as – the numbers would suggest understanding that Skylar Thompson did not play. Yeah, you know, and and Poop, the one thing about this is that, as you say, Mike White really never got a fair shake on this. He was always with the third team, kind of behind the proverbial eight ball. And what I wish is that if the situation was as it appeared, is that Skylar was the number two quarterback all along and Mike White was number three, I wish Mike McDaniel would have been honest with us and told us that when would have been honest with the fans and told the fans that, that look, Skyler is number two, Mike is number three. That's how we're rolling right now. And if things change, then things will change, but this is how it is as opposed to the, well, you know, we're stressing them both out and, and we're putting them in unfamiliar. Just say, uh, you know, Skyler's number two, like you, you said it right now with this move. So I, I, I suspect that Skyler was number two all along, and I, I wish Mike White would, Mike McDaniel would have said that in clear terms. I don't have any issue with what you just said. No, and yeah. and here's the thing too is, I mean, tell me you disagree with me, but to me, neither neither was particularly impressive in training camp practices. I don't know that there was a clear difference between the two. Maybe Skyler a tad better. And then we went to the preseason games, and it's Skyler who starts the preseason opener, and it's Skyler who gets first dibs after two in the in the second game against Washington. And Poop, and, and it's not just um, the games; it was in the joint practices too, right? We saw Skyler getting the nod in the joint practices, uh, getting in there with the second unit ahead of Mike White. Uh, Probably every joint practice, I, I would I would say. Um, and so, yeah, it was, you know, for us who were there and reporting on it and, and you know, telling the fans all the time, Skyler, is, Skyler was the first quarterback after Tua or Skyler started, you know, when during the Tua hold-in. It, it, it was obvious to everybody. I, I, I you know, and, and look, I've got nothing against Mike McDaniel. Mike McDaniel just doesn't really want to um, – put people's business out in the streets, right? He's very polite. He's very respectful. Uh, this has nothing to do with Mike McDaniel lying to us. It's just Mike McDaniel is probably overly polite in a business that, that's really kind of built on raw candor. And so it was, it's just his approach is different in, in many ways. Yeah, no, and you made great point right there when you said he's not about putting anybody's business, including their own and the pecking right. order and all that. And right. it's always, it's always, Everybody's playing well. There's good competition everywhere. I mean, yep. that, that's always a deal. Um, here are other, a couple of other factors I think that need to be brought up is I think we all agree that Skylar Thompson has a higher ceiling as an NFL quarterback. Whether he gets there, who knows? But he's obviously, yes, the arm screen is going to strike here. He's got a better arm than, than Mike White. He's a better athlete than Mike White. The question right now, is he a better quarterback? Is he a better number two quarterback for the Dolphins and what they would require? Again, this is an, this is an offense. Yes, I'm going to say it. That's quarterback friendly mm -hmm. with a lot of pieces in place to make things easy, A, for the offensive line, B, for the quarterback. And no, nobody's going to execute to the same level as Tua, but it's set up to where it doesn't require as much heavy lifting as other offensive schemes. And the question then becomes who's better suited if for a short period of time, who can better keep the Dolphin offense operating at a good level, Skyler or Mike White. And I, I, I still don't know, even though, again, even though Mike Skyler Thompson looked a hell of a lot better than Mike White, I'm still not 100% sure that Skyler would be the answer there. I agree with you. But, you know, when when Skyler told me his goal for this offseason and training camp 
I, I just thought that's brilliant. You know, you're doing what this offense requires. You're doing what you hear in quarter in that quarterback room every day, what you hear at practice every day, anticipation, accuracy, get the ball out of your hands quickly, and you attack those traits and characteristics and you improved on them. And that's why you're the number two backup quarterback. So let's just say that, you know, make sure that we say that. Congrats to Skyler. You worked on what you needed to work toward and you earned it. You're brilliant. That was a very, very good move. So, I, you know, again, I don't have a problem with Skyler being the number two. He outplayed Mike White. Um, I, I just, I, I would like to see the Dolphins keep three quarterbacks because at this point, I'm not convinced that Skyler can do in a game, what we've seen them do in training camp. Correct. And then, and an example of that came in 2022 when he had his game uh, appearances, played seven games in the regular season, two starts against Minnesota and against the New York Jets. And then in the playoff game against Buffalo, where it didn't look, remember, Skylar Thompson was really, I mean, he was lights out in the 2022 preseason. Yes. Yep. And then it didn't translate. Uh, in, important point we need to make here, and this is a clarification we got. And I apologies. I'm going to take the L. I'm going to humble myself. I was wrong. I suck. Okay. I feel better now. Uh, the NFL had owners had approved the bylaw changing the rule regarding the emergency third quarterback to where you didn't have to be on the practice on the active roster anymore. It could be it's the same quarterback from the practice squad elevated every single week. No limits. Apparently we were told clarified the NFL PA did not approve of that bylaw, and I guess they had the power not to, to, to basically deny it. So the rules are the same, meaning for a player to be the emergency third quarterback on game day, he has to be on the 53, which is why I have mentioned it would not shock me if Mike White, who I don't necessarily think, certainly based on his preseason performance, is going to generate a whole lot of interest on the market, not only resigned to the practice squad, but at some point wound up back on the 53 and would be would dress as the third quarterback on game day. Yeah, I have to poop and I, I, I didn't do my homework before the show. I don't know who is in need. I know, I know. I, I don't know who is in need of a backup quarterback, but I, I would think Mike White and his agent are probably looking at contenders with oft injured quarterbacks, Cincinnati. Uh, I, I, you know, places like that before that, you know, they're, I think they will do their due diligence. They'll get a couple of phone calls. It, I, I think that, right. I, I think Mike White would want a job as a backup. If it's a number three job, you probably stay, come back to Miami practice squad. Right. But I, if he could get some, some, you think, you know, yeah, I think. If no, he no, gets I, just, I just don't see, I just don't see any team like banging down his door. Cause I, and I, I apologize for interrupting, but if you look at the AFC contenders, for example, Casey has Carton, Carson Wentz. Right. We're not taking Mike White over him. Buffalo has Mitch Trubisky, who is uh, a, a disappointing number two overall pick in the same class where the Chiefs got Patrick Mahomes, by the way. I still don't think the, Dolph, the, the Bills are calling Mike White to, to replace Mike, Mitch Trubisky. Cincinnati has Jake Browning. Um Baltimore, I don't even know who the Baltimore backup quarterback is right now. Yeah, I think they soup left, didn't he? Huntley, I think he left. I believe he did. I think, I think he's in yeah. Cleveland right now, and yeah. Baltimore picked up somebody else. Can't yep. think of it. The Jets have Tyrod Taylor, who's a better yes. quarterback than, than Mike White. Um, look at the other contenders in the – Houston uh, is you – know, did they stop Case Keenum? Anyway, my, my point is yeah. I, I just don't see – uh, a ton of interest out there in Mike White. I could be wrong, and I hope for his case, dude. I hope for his case, he's got people banging down his door to make to make him an offer. But I, I honestly have a hard time seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a class act, a really nice guy. But um, yeah, Skyler was Skyler clearly performed better. The Dolphins made the right decision based on that. No question about it. No, and two other things that you that I have to love about Mike White, and you you can too if you want to. You don't have to. Number one is he's a big pan, he's a big Panthers fan, Florida Panthers fan, Stanley Cup champion, Florida Panthers. And second of all, we share the same birthday, Mike White and I. So there you go. Nice. Okay, uh, let's move on from the quarterback position uh, because that appears to be settled. The other 
Again, the other player released on Sunday morning was tight end Jody Fortson Jr. If you watch any of the practices, the preseason games, even though, like I said, my first look at him in 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 the spring after he came over from the Kansas City Chiefs was like, oh, damn, this guy looks the part. But no, production wasn't there. And in training camp, uh, with all due respect, he just wasn't good. And then Friday, he didn't play a ton of – no, he did play a lot of snaps, I should say. But he also had – a holding penalty, and he dropped a third down pass when he was wide open in the flat, uh, which was not a great throw, but it was, it was still nobody else around, and it was a floater that he's got to catch. So not a surprise. Yeah, I, I think really Fortson had to beat out uh, or, or really come close to Janu Smith's skill set, and I say that because Durham Smythe, uh, who is both a, mostly an in-line guy. He wasn't going to beat out Durham Smythe. He wasn't going to beat out Jonu Smith. And the funny thing is, Poop, I don't think he was going to beat out Julian Hill because of Julian Hill's in-line skills. So, right, right I, I think he had to be a real Jonu Smith clone to have a chance. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Durham and Julian Hill are there because of their skill set. And if you needed to keep a four tight end, he would have to be really athletic and be able to get you some some yak, some yards after catch and, and that kind of stuff. And I just didn't see that from from Jody Fortson. He didn't show me anything. Plus, he missed um, a decent amount of time with injury. So, yeah, he just kept falling down and down and down. He looked great before the pads came up. He, he, he looked really athletic and everything like that, but when the pads come up, came on, there was no trait or characteristic to separate him from the other tight ends who had a skill that the Dolphins really demanded in their offense. I agree. And, in fact, the Dolphins have two other, other than the guys you mentioned, two other tight ends on the roster who are the rookie free agent Hayden Rucci yeah. and then Tanner Connor. Yeah. And to me, again, being that he was the first guy released would kind of back – my my statement here to me he was number six out of those six in yeah. terms of performance and the question now to me is going to be do they keep a fourth tight end and if they do is it Hayden Rucci who's a good blocker yeah or is it Tanner Connor who's got some sort of a receiving skill set right um, where do you see your toughest I'm assuming you did a final roster projection I did I did okay what was what was your toughest Without revealing everything, you should check it out on sunsentinel.com under Chris Perkins. And without revealing too much, because we want people to read your work, just like we want people to read my work at miamidolphinsonsi.com, what would be a highlight in terms of either the toughest position you had to cut or the biggest name you had to cut, other than Mike White? Ooh. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have Quentin Bell on my, on my final 53. Mm -hmm. I, I just – I didn't see anything from him in the in the joint practices or the preseason games. If they need the numbers for edge rushers, Quentin Bell is on. If they want to go with a different position, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that Quentin Bell is going to make the 53. I'm sure he'd be a shoe in for the practice squad, but uh, I, I don't know. The the other thing, um, really, the backup cornerbacks. That, that was really tough because among Ethan Bonner, Jason Maytree, Isaiah Johnson, and Storm Duck, nobody really stood out. Nobody was really bad, but nobody really stood out. Um, I have, I, I'll say this also. Um, so that, that was a tough choice. I, I ended up putting Storm Duck on there. I'll say that. Um, Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? And I, I had Nick Needham on mine. I know that you didn't. I had him on because I have Nick Needham as the backup nickel uh, behind Cater Kohu. I'm not sure who serves that role if uh, if Nick Needham is not on there. But those were a, a few of my toughest uh, decisions there. And I, and really, I, I think from watching the, the games and including Friday. Jason Matry might be my third team nickel. I think that Storm Duck plays it. I'm not sure if Ethan Bonner plays it. But anyway, Matry would yeah, Matry would be on practice squad. He wouldn't make my 53. But yeah, you know, having the backup nickel is is also something that I looked at for my 53. Interesting. Okay. Um, no, I had a I had a hard time with Nick Needham as well, and. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm going to take another L. Man, I'm having a rough weekend. Um, I was going to do my roster projection this afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Uh, 
anticipating Dolphins would start making move maybe late Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. And of course they beat me to it. Now, if I do a roster projection, look, I'm brilliant. Dolphins are going to keep only two quarterbacks and it's going to be two and Skylar Thompson, but that's not how I roll. So I can't do a final roster projection. Uh, I did one before the preseason finale and I really struggle with Nick Needham. I'll give you another guy who, who hadn't, I had not put on the list and on merit alone, based in training camp and the preseason, would be on there without a doubt. And it's a weird name. I'm going to mention Curtis Bolton. Yes, I agree. That dude is like – I agree. always noticed him. Um, better than Channing Tindall. I know Channing Tindall had a ton of tackles in the game against Tampa Bay. A lot of them are five, six, seven, eight yards down the field, though. Uh, he did have the great open field tackle – on, I think it was he's either an under round or a swing pass where he was in the open field and the, the player tried to cut inside of him and got enough of his leg to, to trip him. That was a great play. Um, yep. And I, I saw signs of progress from Channing Tindall, but to me, he's not a very instinctive linebacker at all. And that's what I saw from Curtis Bolton, who may not be the athlete that Tindall is, but, and I had reached out to somebody in Vegas when the Dolphins signed him and I was told, uh, you know, Jag, but I really liked him. I don't know that he makes a 53, but the dude did himself proud with his performance. As I mentioned, I had a hard time with Nick Needham. I wound up not having him. Uh, this one of those flip a coin. If he's on there, I would not be surprised. And then there are a couple of positions, and this is where I think the notion of the Dolphins being this really, really deep team, or if it's out there, it's not a deep team. Sorry, because a wide receiver, again, there's zero decision to be. The, the only question is they'll be they'll have five or six, whether Odell Beckham Jr. starts on PUP. Yep. The offensive line, I have nine, not counting Isaiah Wynn. I'm assuming he's going to start on PUP. And there was absolutely zero debate as to who the nine were. Uh, and that's not good. You want to be in a situation where, man, uh, and even at the edge position, if, if the biggest debate is whether Quentin Bell makes the 53 or not, that doesn't scream depth, but they are deep on the edge once you factor in Bradley Chubb and a healthy Jalen Phillips because then you have the two rooks. And I will say this, this is something else we need to mention. I would I would go easy on expectations with Chop Robinson early on. I think he's got a very, very high ceiling, but I do worry about the run defense. Uh, I think opponents could take advantage of him either running right at him where he, where if a blocker gets his hands on him, good luck disengaging or overrunning plays. I thought, I thought all the rookies were uh, pretty productive. Um, I thought their best work came against the backups, and when they were in there against the starters, it was kind of you know what you would expect some rookie difficulties. Quite honestly, I, I, and you would you would probably agree. I think right now the rookie with the brightest future is Malik Washington as a punt returner. Uh, not necessarily as a wide receiver, but boy, he took a big shot in that game and bounced back up and continued playing. My hat is off to him. But um, yeah, I, you know, I think that, yeah, Chop shows promise, but you know, you, you when you go in there against the starters, it, it's different than facing the reserves. And I think that we've seen that from Chop. I, I'm not disappointed with Chop in any way, shape or form. And I think he's got a promising future, but you know, he's not going to right now. I don't see him progressing at a meteoric pace. This this isn't like an Aiden Hutchinson type of uh, rise yeah. is, is what I'm saying. He'll probably be an average first round pick, not below average, about an average. He was picked, what, 21, 22? I think 21, yeah. 21. Yeah. So I, that's that's kind of how I see him performing. And, and you know, Patrick Paul, you know, same thing. He's, you know, he'll probably play when Tehran gets a break. Uh, Jalen Wright at running back, I see the same thing. And, and you know, Mo Kamara, he, he'll be at the end of the edge rusher rotation. Like I said, Malik Washington as a punt returner. And then Patrick McMorris, he's got the foot injury. He was in the walking boot. So, you know, there's like zero chance he'll make the 53. He's can you say three. IR? Sure. Can you yeah, say stash, stashed on IR? Sure you can. Yep. Yep. So I, I think the rookie class was productive, but I, I don't see any – superstar performance at this point from that rookie class. Malik, I think, again, has the brightest future right now as a rookie, and that's as a punt returner. I, yeah, I think some people might say, well, look at what Jalen Wright did. And, again, 
this was against backups, and right. I still don't know exactly how many touches he gets with Raheem Mostert and Devon Achan ahead of him. Yep. And the other question with Malik Washington, is he really going to unseat at this time Braxton Berrios as the returner? Um, Braxton Berrios. I, I, a, go ahead. I think punt returns. And, and then on kickoff returns, we've seen them. I think we've seen two deep, right? We've seen Braxton yeah. and Malik. So, that you know, that's I, I, you know that's why as a returner, and especially as a punt returner, but, yeah, kickoff returner, I think Braxton Berrios. I think Braxton is the deep guy and Malik is the up guy kind of. Uh, or Braxton gets the first shot is how I've read things at, at returning the kickoff. No, uh, yeah, without question. Um, before we go, the wide receiver position, again, injury after injury after injury. I, Anthony Schwartz, who probably wasn't going to make the roster anyway, looks like apparently per reports got a torn ligament in his knee. River Craycraft, I think we both agree more than likely he's going to start the season on, on IR. Based on Mike McDaniel's comments and what we know, what we saw, I think Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell is no reason for major concern in week one. Who the hell is, I mean, behind those two? It's You're going to be Braxton Berrios, Malik Washington, and Eric Azukama, who Mike McDaniel said is week to week, but not long term. So I think you were talking about week to week, and the regular season starts for the Dolphins in two weeks. Yeah. Doesn't sound terribly encouraging. He's ready for week one. And if Odell Beckham Jr. has to start on PUP, that's four wide receivers. Yep. Yeah, I you know, um I poop I I've been complimentary of the Dolphins on their depth. I I think that their depth got them to the playoffs the last two years. And not that I'm I'm not saying that any of the depth guys played at a Pro Bowl level. What I'm saying is you know the injury problems they had and they needed those guys to get to the playoffs, you know. So you needed, you know, Kendall Lamb and, and Andrew Van Ginkle and, and all of these guys. So I do think that their depth is going to be good enough once again. The problem is if you take an injury at a key position, you're probably worse off this year than you were in the previous two years. Wide receiver, as you say, is one of those. I think cornerback might be another one um, where, yeah, if, if one of those primary guys gets injured, you could be in a world of trouble. Although – I will say this also at cornerback, we've seen guys like, or, or in the secondary, we've seen Clayton Fedulum and, and Keon Crossan and Justin Bethel come in. And while none of them played at a Pro Bowl level, none of them lost the Dolphins a game. It's, well, look, here's, sure here's my about thing. That? Wait a minute, Poop. Here's my thing. Now, when you get a lot of these backups, especially at quarterback, your job is not to lose the game, right? When when you have a backup, if you have a backup guard in there, don't lose the game. And now, now you know, uh, Liam Eikenberg, you have to do more. Austin Jackson, you have to do more. Teron, you have to do more. Uh, the tight end, Durham Smythe, you have to do more. You're, I'm not relying on this backup the same way I would rely on a starter. I'm relying on the other starters to do a little bit more. So that's kind of how I look at backups in general and why the Dolphins made the playoffs and why guys like Clayton Fedulum and, and, and Justin Bethel can come in and they're not going to lose you the game because you do still have enough talent for others to do their job. That's how I look at backups and that's how I look at the Dolphins depth this year. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure you and I are like this on this no, one. Probably no, not, probably not. Probably not. Um, but here, here's the thing. Nobody in the NFL has, studs on the first and second team at every position. Just, right. That's just not reality because of the salary cap and all that. My own, my concern with this, and I understand the Dolphins are very, are very cautious and wisely so, but my Lord, did they have a high number of their key players miss a lot of practice time in training camp. Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, Teron Armstead, Javon Holland, Jalen Ramsey, Jalen Phillips, Bradley Chubb. I mean, that's a yep. lot of – those are like your foundational guys. Yep. And yep. while it would have been gross mismanagement to have guys in there if they're not completely right, again, in an ideal world, your guys get the benefit of a full training camp with an off day here or there. But, again, there's an awful lot of – 
miss practice time for all of those guys, which has me, dare I say it, a bit queasy. <laughs> Let me say this, Poop. I think more and more in the league, we're going to see teams using kind of the first two or three games, not as a preseason, but to kind of feel around, right? And look, the Dolphins, how many, how much time did that secondary, the starting secondary spend together here in training camp? Because Hoyer was out, Holland was out, Ramsey was out, right? And so I, I think that's kind of a trend around the league. The Dolphins have been fortunate. They've started eight and three and nine and three. So, you know, this stuff in, in training camp, the long breaks for guys like Armstead and Mostert, it has not cost them. I don't think it will cost them again this year. I think that, yeah, it's going to be more the trend that, as, especially when you go to the 18 game season, you're going to take games, you're going to take time yeah. off in, the, in training camp. And, right, the, the first month, you're going to not use it as preseason, but you're just going to kind of figure out more. What can we do with these starters? You know, does this work? Does this work? Does that work? Fair point. Uh, but this is, this is a team whose offense needs to come out firing All right. All right. because I think because the defense is a lot more unsettled. And again, there was a lot of missed practice time and the offense has been together for it's the third year now. This is what happened last year as the as the defense was working its way under Vic Fangio's system. Well, in two of the first three games, they scored 36 against the Chargers, and they, they put the 70 burger on the Broncos. Yeah. Again, then we're starting off now with Jacksonville and Buffalo at home. I think the offense is going to have to pull more than its share of the load if the Dolphins are going to get off to another quick start. And speaking of start, we have reached the end. You like that just juxtaposition here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. That's going to wrap it up for this Sunday. I want to thank my guest, my pal, my buddy, Chris Perkins, from the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Please check out his work at sunsentinel.com. Uh, everyone who's tuned in, thank you. Please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. That'll wrap it up for Sunday. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll be back on Monday. Thanks, everyone.